Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 AP English, the Roberts Lectures. We are, of course, in the poetry section, and now we turn to A.E. Hausman's On Windlock Edge uh, on page 767. Uh, uh, this is a, a poem from 1887. Now, of course, Hausman is one of the great favorites for us in Room 303 to an athlete dying young, uh, one when I was one in 20. Of course, you can find these lectures uh, at learnstrong.net and, uh, and as well in the Roberts uh, text we have loveliest of trees on uh, page 691. Now Hausman's dates 1859 to 1936 great English classical uh, scholar as well as of course poet. He's best known as we have said before for the Shropshire Lad that collection of poems that love to kind of think about lost youth and, uh, and, and the English countryside as well. Go back, of course, to our comments on to an athlete dying young. And, uh, and, and here now we're going to get this really interesting poem on Winlock Edge. I want to begin actually on 767 at the bottom with your, uh, with your footnote information there. Winlock Edge is a range of high hills in western England, south of Birmingham, um, Shropshire is the area there. Um, and you're going to have a, uh, Shrewsbury is the, is the town, and, and a, a long time ago it was called the Uricon, uh, when the Romans inhabited uh, Britannia. Now, what makes this poem so fascinating, we're gonna, we're gonna listen to a professional reader and then we're gonna talk about it, but what makes this poem so fascinating is, put it in your nose, the history of time and place, okay, as being significant, because the very place where you are sitting right now, because we're giving this lecture in Worland, Wyoming, in the middle of the Badlands of the Bighorn Basin, but we know that, of course, 150 years ago, that where you're sitting, it didn't look the way it looks now. Right? There are, of course, different kinds of things happening in the very spot where you're sitting right now. For example, we know that there were large numbers of, uh, of bison that uh, will have roamed through this area. There were, of course, native peoples, as we will speak of them today, native peoples who inhabited the very land that you now you know, sit on in, in room 303. That sense of distance and yet that sense of somehow no distance is going to be central to this poem. Okay, let's go ahead and enjoy the poem, let's read it, and then we will uh, come back to, uh, to exegete. On Wenlock Edge, the woods in trouble, his forest fleece the reek and heaves, the gale it plies the saplings double, and thick on seven snow the leaves. It would blow like this through halt and hangar, when Uricon the city stood. Tis the old wind in the old anger, but then it threshed another wood. Then, t'was before my time, the Roman at yonder heaving hill would stare, the blood that warms an English yeoman, the thoughts that hurt him, they were there. There, like the wind through woods in riot, through him the gale of life blew high. The tree of man was never quiet, then t'was the Roman, now tis I. The gale it plies the saplings double, it blows so hard twill soon be gone. Today the Roman and his trouble are ashes under Uricon. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's turn now to this uh, little poem and the, its view of history. Let's put that in our notes right away. This will be significant. Uh, as we think about what Marcus Aurelius says in Meditations, one of those lines that we have said often in 303, soon you will have forgotten all things, and all things will have forgotten you, which of course gives us a little bit of humility right away. T.S. Eliot's East Coker comes to mind. The only wisdom we can hope to acquire is the wisdom of humility. Humility is endless. And we're certainly going to be playing that game here. We'll also be messing around with this notion of the passage of time and the withered stumps of time, as T.S. Eliot will call it in, in, in Wasteland, this idea that things seem to have this tendency to recapitulate, to repeat. We live, of course, in a state where there's lots of ghost towns nearby. Jibo comes to mind, a small ghost town. If you visit it, as I recently did with a pal of mine, one of the observations that was made by him was that 
I wonder in a hundred plus years if our town, Whirlin, will look like this ghost town does today. Of course, that gives us a bit of a shudder to think of it in those terms, doesn't it? Because we have this tendency to think that what we live in is the way it's always been and the way it always will be. And of course, we know that our study of history tells us otherwise. We begin with the wind, where uh, the, the speaker of the poem, a young man, looking out over uh, an area on Winlock Edge. The wood's in trouble because we've got the, the, the wind coming. In other words, it's picking up all these leaves and it's blowing it away. Now, of course, falling leaves is always a symbol. Let's put it in 2B. Falling leaves is always a symbol for us. We've seen this many times before, right? And then he says about this blowing of leaves that this is exactly how it did when Uricon, the city stood, as opposed to uh, Shrewsbury, where, where na now, you know, he's looking out over it. Tis the old wind in the old anger, and then it threshed another wood. In other words, back then, the wind blew, just like it's blowing now. Nothing seems to have changed. Stand in the badlands and let that wind blow against your face. And it's not much different from what some person 150 years ago felt as it was blowing on his or her face. Back to the word then at line 9. Then, t'was before my time, the Roman at yonder heaving hill would stare. The blood that warms an English yeoman, the thoughts that hurt him, they were there. In other words, the synchronicity of history, the ways in which the concerns that we have today are the same concerns that people had 150 years ago. Well, that can't be true. I mean, come on. We are moderns, or even postmoderns, or even, dare we say it, post postmoderns. Clearly, the stuff we worry about is so different from what those people long ago worried about. And yet, this poem suggests, are you really sure that the ultimate questions, the questions of ultimate value and meaning, have really changed that much, or are they probably pretty much the same questions that we've always enjoined as human beings? He says, there. Notice at, at, at line eight, uh, nine, it was then, now it's there. There, like the wind through woods in riot, through him the gale of life blew high. In other words, life is kind of like a storm or a wind that's constantly coming. And he says, I'm not sure that there was much difference when the Romans ran this place than now. To continue, the tree, the famous line of this poem, the tree of man was never quiet, then t'was the Roman, now tis I. The identification with history, the repetition of certain kinds of questions. There is great value in reading history this way. Instead of seeing yourself as somehow an outside observer that cannot capture or understand moments of the past, try and, try and, and understand your own questions as being their questions. Of course, Stephen Dadalus will say in Joyce's Ulysses that history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to away. In some ways, we're playing a similar kind of game going backwards to recapture what were the challenges, what were the dreams, what were the nightmares maybe, what were the storms, what were the concerns. The gale, the storm, it plies the saplings double. Notice the repeat of line three here, right? It blows so hard, twill soon be gone. That, that interesting, it's, it's an interesting question. The antecedent to the pronoun it, what is it that soon will be gone? Well, obviously the wind. I mean, it blows for a while and then it goes. But we could say that there's another antecedent to the pronoun it. Yes, that is to say the civilization that I now am enjoying, just like the Roman from years prior that now is gone, that my civilization will, sometime, will someday also possibly be gone. Right? Today the Roman and his trouble are ashes under Uruguay. In other words... All things have this cyclical tendency. Go back to our comments on W.B. Yeats at LearnStrong.net and, uh, and, and the ways in which Yeats made the same argument that there is, in Second Coming, we have this same cyclical kind of understanding happening. Well, at 2A, major messages, we said it soon, you will have forgotten all things, all things will have forgotten you. The cyclical nature of time, the cyclical nature of history. The identification, another major message here, the identification of the questions of ultimate meaning and reality, they haven't changed that much. We are 
constantly rediscovering the questions of an earlier time, an earlier generation. At 2B, well obviously we have all kinds of symbolism going on here, no question. The wind, obviously trees uh, are two of the profound ones, right, and the dropping of leaves off of trees. At 3A, I mentioned Marcus Aurelius. So many ideas and titles come to mind here of the recapitulation of history, the ways in which things um, seem to kind of come back again and again and again. And finally at 3B, what is your view of history? And to what degree do you accept the fact that you kind of lived in some bizarre way outside of history and outside of time, and then you come into your senior year as a high school student or your freshman year as a college student, and you find yourself starting to look at time and history differently. With questions like, in world history, why is it that we always ended a unit with the fall of a civilization, and then the next unit began with the rise of the new civilization? And how is it possible that I could do that kind of study and not in any way take that observation personally? In 500 years, will the room you're sitting in right now in 303 still be here? See, we have a tendency to think not. When we visit the ruins in Rome, for example, we have a tendency to think, now 303 will probably not be here, which obviously leads us to ask the question, is 303 the walls or the space within the walls? And how do you think about history and how do you think about time? How do you think your time will be remembered? Go back to W.B. Yeats's and our comments on sailing to Byzantium, caught in that central music of neglect, all, uh, neglect monuments of an aging intellect. What is it that is unaging within our time that you think will be remembered at all? It may be catastrophes, it may be accomplishments. What do you consider to be, from your own time period, the great things that will be remembered. Well, there you go, A.E. Hausman. Uh, what a wonderful poet to challenge us to think about ourselves, our past, our future. Thank you.